Hi, thank you so much for staying connected to Passionate Life Church and joining us online. Get ready for an awesome message. Good morning. How you guys doing today? You guys doing all right? Awesome. My name is Andrew. I'm the lead pastor. For those of you that do not know me, I want to welcome everybody that is watching us online right now. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in and staying connected to Passionate Life Church. We have an awesome, awesome uh, speaker here today. I just want to remind everybody, next week is Mother's Day. Pastor Dawn, the mother of this house, is going to bring a fire word next week for our moms and our families. And then the following week, we're going to kick back up with our series called Shaken. You're not going to want to miss it as we talk about worry and complaining. Come on, somebody. Come on. Come on. I want you guys to give your best passionate life, church. Welcome to Dalton Reisner. Come on, everybody. Let's go, baby. Come on, come on. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it so much. This is my second service. I can't tell you guys how much I love Passionate Life Church. I have my fiance over here, Whitney, my younger brother, Kaysen, and his fiance as well. So thank you for having me. For those of you that don't know, my name is Dalton Reisner. I normally do not tuck my boots in, but I tucked in my jeans in today because I really got these new pair of boots that have my number and my initials, so I thought you guys might want to see that. Yeah. But for all those cowboys out there, I do put my jeans over my boots, I promise. So, my name is Dalton Reisner, number 66. I play left guard for the Denver Broncos, and I am from Wiggins, Colorado, a town of about 800 people, maybe 1,000. And you know, I was born in Springfield, Missouri, but I moved here when I was like four years old. And ever since I can remember, I wanted to be a cowboy. I know I'm not the size of a cowboy, I know I'm not a cowboy, but I wanted to be. Lane Frost, in the movie Eight Seconds, was like one of my heroes. I wanted to ride bulls like Lane Frost. Sad thing is, I got into bull riding, and I was a little bit too concerned with the concession stand than I was riding the actual bull. <laughs> So I started to catch a trend. You know, a few cowboys came up to me and told me, Dalton, you're 12 years old and you're the size of a PBR bull rider already. And started to kind of get the term, okay, I'm probably not going to be a cowboy. I sure did love it, thought it was really fun. But as I got older throughout my life, I figured out, okay, cowboy's probably not going to work out. And I'm this pretty big kid, and I'm about probably 12 or 13, and I start to play football. I noticed that I'm really good at football. And the reason I'm telling you guys all this is because I want us to connect. I know some of you might know that I play for the Broncos and who I am, but I want you guys to know really who I am and connect with me before I get into talking about Jesus Christ, right, which is so fun. It gets me excited. I was supposed to go 30 minutes last service, and I think I went 50 minutes total, so we're in it for the long haul today, all right? It's going to be fun. Uh, so I started football. This is where my journey started. I, I obviously played peewee ball, everything like that, but when I got into middle school, it started to become more real that this is a sport that I really enjoyed. And I went up to my father, and my father and I, growing up, he was extremely hard on me. I'll tell you guys a few stories about my, my dad, and don't think he's not a good guy, because he's the reason I'm standing here today, is because my father and how hard he was on me, how much he pushed me to be a good football player. I told him, Dad, I want to play Division I football, and I want to play in the NFL someday. And my dad's the type of person that when you tell him you want to do something, he's going to figure out ways to make that happen. And he's going to let you know what it's going to take to make that happen. And if you make that choice to tell him you want to do it two times, you're in it. There ain't no getting out of it. You're going to do it, right? So I told my dad, I said, I want to do that. I said, okay, well, you're going to have to do more than what everyone else at your level does. If you think you're doing enough, you're not doing enough. Whoever's doing this at your level, you need to be doing this. So we need to go to 15 camps this summer. So starting my eighth grade year, we went to about 15 camps that year. My older brother Taylor went to some camps with me. We were in Arizona, pretty much every camp in Colorado, Wyoming, you name it. And we started to go to all these football camps. I remember it was my freshman summer. I went to a football camp in Nebraska with a family I didn't even really know. 
And I had to do that because my parents had to work. They had things to do. They couldn't go to every single camp all summer. And it was a time of that year where you're getting into high school and you don't quite know who you are. You're trying to figure out what you want to do in life. You think you love football. You think it's cool to see the NFL on TV, but you don't really know what it takes to get there. And the reason I haven't mentioned anything about my faith is because I didn't really know who Jesus was in high school. I didn't know who Jesus was. didn't really get to know him until I got to college. Now, I was raised in an amazing home where we went to church every Sunday. We went to youth group every Wednesday. Sunday school, I loved because every Sunday school, for every verse you memorize, you got a free pizza. So I memorized like 20 verses a Sunday. I was killing it. You got to motivate big guys like you know how. You know, we're motivated in certain ways. So I loved, mem- I loved memorizing verses. I was baptized. I believed in Jesus. I had faith in Jesus Christ and who he was in my life. But, you know, I didn't get to know who Jesus was. I didn't speak to Jesus. I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. So that's why I haven't mentioned it yet, but I can't wait. I'm going to get to it. So I was at Nebraska football camp. And I called my dad crying because it had been probably two or three years of us going to all these camps, and no one would pay attention to me. I was just this little chunky kid with a big dream, man. Just a big old heart and a big dream. My whole life I had been good to people and Loved being around people. I couldn't meet a stranger. Very outgoing. I loved to lead others. How my parents raised me. And I called my dad and I said, you know, I can't do this. Like, no one's paying attention to me. I don't know why I'm here. My friends are at the lake. They're having a great time. I want to do that too. Maybe this, maybe this is true. Maybe I can't do it. Because no one had went on to play Division I football from Wigan, let alone the NFL. And he encouraged me. He encouraged me to stay and stick it out and that good things would happen. And at this point in my life, like I said, I didn't really know Jesus, but I knew how to pray. So I prayed to Jesus that night and prayed to God and said, like, man, like, please give me something. And the next day, it was pretty cool. The Nebraska offensive line coach came up to me and he said, Dalton, you did a really good job at camp. He wrote my name down. To this day, I don't think he wrote anything down. I think he knew I was sad. But hey, it meant a lot to me. So I was like riding high. I'm like, man, I think I can do this. Nebraska University paid attention to me. So I get to Wyoming camp a week after. And this is my freshman summer, remind you. I'm still a little kid at the time. Big, big body little kid. And the offensive line coach and the head coach always like to go shake their hands after camps that I went to. So I went up and I shook his hand and I said, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I've been here three years in a row. Open my tape. Just give me a shot. I know the guys I go against are like 5'8", 150 pounds, but I promise I can do it. And he looked at me and he said, Dalton, I think you need to start going to Division II, Division II football camps. He said, I don't think you should come back to camp. Because he didn't feel like I was doing good enough. And I remember, you guys might think that's a little bit sad, but for me, that was instrumental in my career as a football player. It lit a fire underneath of me. I don't like to be told no. All you have to do is after the service, go ask Whitney and she'll tell you. I don't like to be told no. And when he told me no... Man, it fired me up, and it told me he doesn't think that I can do it. So over the next year, I worked extremely hard, gained some weight, got bigger, got bigger in the weight room. I went back to that very same camp in Wyoming. I think this was my sophomore summer, and the same head coach offered me a full-ride scholarship to play football for Wyoming football. And So coming from where I came from, a 1A school, with 17 guys on my football team. I grew up on a ranch, building fence, bull riding, barrel racing, roping, kind of switched over to football. After I got one offer, a lot of different offers came in, and I actually made the choice to go to Kansas State University, a a university that felt like resembled where I was from, from Wiggins, and a coach in Bill Snyder that I felt like wanted to form me into a better man, a better teammate, a better friend, husband, a better son, a better follower of Christ, before being a better football player. He was a lot like my dad. He was extremely hard on his players, but, you know, he had a plan as to what he was doing. So I show up to Kansas State. You know, I wasn't the biggest anymore. I wasn't the fastest anymore. I wasn't the strongest, and no one knew who I was. I went from Wiggins, Colorado, to all these guys that I was bigger than, to being in college with Big 12 football players. I wasn't used to it. I hadn't been tested in my faith, like I told you guys. I had faith in who Jesus was. I knew he was real, but I didn't have a relationship with him. I hadn't been tested in my football ability. I was just bigger than everyone growing up. I had never been uncomfortable. I had never had someone be stronger than me or faster than me. 
or better than me. And I got to Kansas State and everyone was. And my faith hadn't been tested. I was lost. I remember two weeks into Kansas State football, maybe three weeks, I called my dad. And don't, don't take this the wrong way when I tell you about what my dad says. I promise, he's a great guy. And I told him I want to be done. I told him, you're right. Like, everyone's right. The people that don't believe in me, when you're in a small town, everyone knows everything. You hear all the rumors. And like, if you get in trouble at school, like your dad's going to be talking to the principal within two minutes because they're best friends. And, oh my gosh, man, I call him and I say, I can't do it. Everyone was right. Like, I'm, I'm not bigger, I'm not faster, I'm not stronger, I can't do it here. I think it, it's not going to happen. And, and I said, Dad, I'm coming home. And he said, what home? And I said, well, you're home. And he said, what home? You're, you don't, nope, you're not coming home. And right then and there, I'm like, okay, so I'm going to have to fight this thing out on my own. My dad's given me some tough love. And I, I'm so grateful that he did that. I'm so grateful that he didn't allow me to go home and allow me to quit. I'm so glad he taught me such a huge lesson about pushing through even when you feel like you can't. And man, that doesn't just resonate with football. That resonates in our walk with God because we are imperfect. I can get up here. You guys might think it's cool. I'm a Denver Bronco. Maybe you don't. You might think it's cool because I want to talk about Jesus. But at the end of the day, whether I'm up here or out there, we all have our issues. We all have to continue pushing through and we all struggle at times. So I was struggling and I had to push through. And that's exactly what I did. But you know what? One person that helped me a lot is a guy by the name of Morgan Burns. And Morgan Burns is someone I still talk about to this day. Morgan Burns, I moved into the freshman dorms. Freshman dorms you live in for one year, and then you're out. You're going to go get your own house and live with your boys and have a great time. Morgan Burns was a fifth-year senior when I was a freshman, and he was still in the dorms. And I remember asking him, like, Morgan, why, like, why are you in the dorms still? And he says, like, I'm doing this for you guys. I'm doing this for Jesus. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. They're like, this is what college is. Like, you have to stay in dorms to make Jesus happy. Like, what? And, like, this is going to be a wild ride. I don't know what I got myself into. And he looks at me and he says, you know, I do this for guys like you. I do this for freshmen that come in that are lost, don't necessarily know Jesus like they, they should, necessarily are struggling, whatever it may be. They're without mom and dad. Because I want you guys to make the right decisions. I want you guys to have a role model in your life. I want you to have someone that's going to run a Bible study on Wednesday nights in the basement of the dorms. Someone that's going to watch over you guys. And I remember just after he told me that, how cool I thought that was. That a guy would, because those dorms are not fun. He stayed there for five years because he wanted to have a relationship with the freshmen and make sure that we got put on the right foot. And we got started off on the right foot. And then the next thing that happened, Morgan leaves. So Morgan had, you know, instructed me on how to be a good Christian and talked to me about how to open up the Bible and just read to God. I told him, like, Morgan, you always talk about God's talking to you, and you're talking to Jesus, and you have this purpose, and you have an identity. I don't even know what purpose means or what an identity is. I just play football. And Morgan started to talk to me about how you open the Bible, and you read, and you talk to Jesus, and you get to know him. And when things are good and when things are bad, it doesn't matter. You talk to him all the time. And I started to do that, and Morgan had such an impact on me. I started getting to know Jesus. He started speaking to me. I started figuring out who Dalton Reisner was. I started feeling like I woke up with a purpose and that I had an identity outside of a football player. Because my whole life it was Dalton Roger the football player and Dalton Roger the good guy, the nice guy. He was always kind to people. But you know, I didn't know who else I was other than that. So Morgan left and he went to the NFL. Morgan wasn't drafted. So what happens when you're not drafted is you have to go to a, a, a training camp. About 40 guys get to go to training camp. We'll have, we just drafted seven guys as part of the Broncos these last three days. And we'll have 40 extra guys from across the world, nation. They'll show up in about two weeks, and three of them will make the team. Three of them. So if you're not drafted, it's extremely hard. And even some of the drafted guys will get cut. Morgan goes as an undrafted guy to the Tennessee Titans. And he goes to camp, and he makes the team. He was one of the three out of the 40 that made the team. Morgan Burns, to this day, if you look him up on the internet, is the quickest player to ever retire from the NFL. As soon as Morgan Burns was told that he had made the team, he said, thank you. I was here to prove to myself that I could. I didn't want to live the rest of my life tell, telling people that I could have, should have, would have. But my purpose is not to be a football player. My purpose is to be a missionary for God. And, yeah, he deserves a round of applause. And, you know, that's why I looked up to Morgan so much. Because he had an identity. He knew who he, who he was. He had a purpose. He was set on that. And he proved to himself he could do it in the NFL, but that's not the purpose he had. That wasn't the identity that Morgan Burns had. And that had such a big impact on me seeing that. 
Like, wow, how powerful and cool it would be to be that strong in my faith. Have that great of a relationship with Jesus Christ. So as my, my tenure at Kansas State continued, I continued to go stronger and stronger with my relationship with Jesus Christ. I started to talk to other people about it. I started to be a disciple and pray. And the good times and the bad times, I was speaking to Jesus. In my fifth and final year, I started to do more and more in the community, and which helped me find out who I was as a person. I started to you know, go to nursing homes, go to schools. I was speaking a lot. My major was communication, so I love this stuff. It just gets me excited. And I became a big brother to a kid named Caden who had AOL leukemia cancer and was paralyzed by age three. He regained his movement by age four. We became friends. Two years later, was put on remission, and he ran the Kansas State football team out of the tunnel when he got put on remission. And I, and I started doing other things with the Special Olympics. And I just started being more involved in the community. God helped me find that. Morgan helped me find that. I started this relationship with Jesus and asking him who I was and what I wanted to do. And that's where God led me. And that's where I started to figure out, wow, I am not Dalton Reisner, the football player. I am Dalton Reisner, the disciple of God. So as my Kansas State career ended, I was figuring out who Dalton was. I was confident in myself. I had an identity. I had a purpose. And I left and I got drafted by the Denver Broncos in the second round, pick 41 overall. And you know, it was a dream come true for me. It was a dream come true. But you know what? The, the reason it was so cool wasn't because I get to play for the Broncos, because I get to play at mile high and all that cool stuff. The reason it's cool is because as soon as I was drafted, I was given a platform by God to be a role model, to talk about Jesus, to be a good person in this world, to make an impact. Not to talk about a big gold chain or talk about a car or a house or the fame and the fortune. I was thankful because I get to, I get to make an impact. I have millions of eyes on me when I play national television. I can have a Bible verse on my arm. I can do an interview after and talk about Jesus Christ openly. That's why I was excited. That's why I was so excited about this dream. And maybe as a kid, it started off, I just wanted to be a Bronco. But as I got older and I found my relationship with Jesus, what got more and more important to me was having the platform that I believe God blessed me with. You know, I was going to get to it later, but I'm really passionate about this. As I stand up here on stage, I'm six foot five, 310 pounds. I did not work hard to be six foot five. I was blessed with that. I haven't mentioned weight because I work extremely hard to weigh 310. I love to eat. Pretty fun. I'm really hungry. Um, but I didn't work hard to be six foot five, y'all. I was blessed with that. So am I going to sit up here today and say, no one has any idea how hard I work. I did this all by myself. I would feel silly because look at my body. There's a lot of guys that would kill to have this size and to play professional sports. I was blessed with this from Jesus, and I want to make him proud. I want to glorify him with what he blessed me with. He didn't bless me with this size to say, hey, Dalton, you go be a dang good football player and you go make sure everyone knows you and everyone worships you. No, he wanted me to be a great football player so I could have the platform to be doing what I'm literally doing right now and smile about doing it, to spread his word. So that was my intro. That's a little bit getting to know Dalton Reisner. I know it's a little bit long, but for those of you that don't know who I am, you have a little bit of background about who I am now. The theme I chose today was rebuild. Why I chose rebuild, because you look at 2020, the year that we had, and really how 2021 kind of started off, and what we need to do is rebuild. Whether it's rebuild in our life, rebuild in our faith, rebuild in our job, rebuild in our families. It was a tough year on all of us. Extremely tough. Same thing with the Broncos, y'all. It ain't, here's the deal, don't laugh too quick because it's not a rebuilding year. We're rebuilding now, but no, no one called it a rebuilding year this year. It's time to go win a Super Bowl, all right? That's what we're going to do. So, yes, I'm talking about rebuild, but no one take that as it's a rebuilding year for the Broncos. It's not going to happen. No, nope, we're done with that. That was the last two years, okay? But when I think about rebuild, one thing that I think is extremely important is finish. You have to finish. On the football field, my job as an offensive lineman purely is to finish. They don't care if I have a great first step 
or long arms or I'm fast. It's about how I finish every single play. Do I drive my guy into the dirt on a run play? Do I finish my block on a pass play so that he can't even lay a finger on my quarterback? That is how my dream has come true, is by finishing. That is every part of my job. If you take away anything from offensive linemen and say they need one thing, they need finish. You can finish, you can be a great offensive lineman. And really for anything in life if you finish. And I think about finishing and how important that is in rebuilding. If you want to rebuild a football team, you want to rebuild your faith, you're going to need to finish. When it comes to your relationship with Jesus, you can't just go straight to finishing. Too many of us try to rush it. And we want to have this beautiful relationship with Jesus Christ and be these great Christians, but you can't go straight to the finish line. It's all about finishing, but you got to put the work in. And I put a verse on the, on the board, it's Psalms 37.5. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will act. Before we finish, we have to commit. When I'm out there on the football field and I'm lining up as left guard and i got 380-pound human lined across me that's snot dribbling down his chin, I can't just finish him right off the bat. I can't just say, I'm going to finish you right now. I'm going to commit my way to it. I'm going to make sure that I know the right technique to use. I know the play, the snap count, everything that's required to, so that I can finish him. And I think the same thing is with our faith, is we have to commit our way to the Lord. We have to trust in Him, and He will act. He will do the rest. He will do the rest. We commit our way, and we trust the rest will happen. And before we know it, we'll find ourselves finishing as Christians, which I think is so important. So the first part of rebuilding, other than finish, that I want to mention, is identity. And I get so excited to talk about identity because I think it's so important. Who we are. I think it's important to know who we are and whose we are. Who is Dalton Reisner? And whose am I? God. I'm God. When you think about a team, if we're thinking for a football aspect, you think about a losing culture. When teams lose... It's usually because there's a bunch of individuals that don't know who they are, that don't have identity. It's a team that doesn't have identity. And you look at our last two years with the Denver Broncos, and I feel like we haven't really had an identity. There's been a lot of individuals with a lot of talent, because we have a lot of talent on our football team. But we haven't came together as a team to make that happen. You think of it as a fist, right? As an offensive lineman, this is my favorite analogy. If you have five offensive linemen, the five best linemen in the league, and you try to strike someone like this, it's not going to be very powerful because it's five individuals. You're not one. But you start closing them and you connect and then you have a fist because it's all five of you working together. And being an offensive lineman my whole life, I know how important that is to work together and know who you are. So the verse is 1 Peter 4.10. It says, each of you should use whatever gifts you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And I strongly believe this. Everyone in this room has a gift from God. Everyone has a gift from God. We may not all know it. That's a part of finding out our identity. Heck, I didn't even know it until I was in my fourth or fifth year of college. And I started to figure out, who is Dalton Reisner? What is my gift? And how can I use it to glorify God? My gift may be football. I mentioned to Andrew in the first service, I feel pretty comfortable up here. I love it. My gift might be public speaking. I don't know. But man... I think it's all about each and every one of us using the gift that we receive to serve others as God's grace in its various forms. How can I wake up and glorify God today with the, the gift that I was received, the identity that I have? And it's so important to have identity because if we don't have identity and you don't love yourself, it's going to be really hard in your relationship with your significant other, and it's going to be hard in your relationship with Jesus and really just other people. Because you have to love yourself. You have to know who you are. You have to have a purpose every single day. When I look out, every one of us might try to deny this, but we all wake up and we say we want to have a purpose. I promise you I'll be the first one to admit it. I wake up every day and I want to feel like there's a reason I'm down here on earth. I want to feel like I have purpose, like I matter. I don't want to be down here thinking that I don't have a purpose down here. That's what's so good about believing in Jesus Christ. We can think about living eternally and thinking about how we can glorify him every single day. And have a purpose down here. I'm not Dalton Reisner to, to play a silly game of football with a leather ball. That's going to end. That's materialistic. I could be gone tomorrow. But if it is gone tomorrow, who am I going to look in the mirror and see? I sure hope I look in the mirror and say, Dalton Reisner, the disciple. Dalton Reisner, the follower of Jesus. Yeah. 
So that's why I think identity is so important. And I think purpose plays a role right into that. If you love who you are, you know who you are, you know whose you are, and you have a purpose every single day, you'll be happy in yourself. And you know what's really cool about when you get happy within yourself and you know who you are? I speak from my you know, experience with a football team, is then you become a team. Because now you all know who each other are. Now you start getting to know each other. And that's my next point, is getting to know each other. When you're rebuilding a football team or rebuilding your faith, one, I think it's important to know your identity. Second, I'd say it's getting to know, getting to know others is extremely important when trying to rebuild. Think of it from a football standpoint. Getting to know others. Why is that important when you're trying to rebuild a team? You need to know your teammate. On the offensive line, I play next to Lloyd Cushenberry, our center. He's a younger guy last year. He, he might have need, needed help on certain plays, calling the plays. So I knew I was going to have to help him with that. But I knew he was really physically talented, so I knew his strengths and weaknesses. I got Garrett Bowles over here. I know his strengths and weaknesses. How do I help Garrett Bowles? How do they both help me? you got to get to know each other. And then when push comes to shove, and we're playing the Chargers last year at home, down 21 points in the fourth quarter, and come back and win the game with like zero time left, you got to know your teammates. Heck yeah, you know it. There'll be more of that this year. And you got to know your teammates in times like that. Because y'all, if you haven't played football, I promise you, you know what it's like because you guys believe in Jesus, and I'll, I'll correlate real soon. But when you're out there, and you are all dog-tired, and they call a play that you know means that you're one-on-one, -on -one, you don't have the center help anymore, and you got some guy that you've been playing on the video game for 10 years, but now all of a sudden he's in front of you. You need to know your teammates. Because i got to give a look to Bulls like, bro, if your guy drops, come help me right away. Because this guy's drooling and it's about to get ugly. you got to know your teammates. It's so important to know your teammates. Getting to know others. And how I think that correlates with our faith and our relationship with Jesus is getting to know each other. Of course it's important for here at Passionate Live Church for all of you to know each other. Of course it's important. So you guys can push each other, get to know each other, love each other, grow, help each other grow, hold each other accountable. But you know what I think is even more important that some of us forget? I have guys on my football team that don't believe in Jesus. It is extremely important not to stay away from those people. I'm not saying hang out with them every day and believe what they believe. I love being around them. God, I'm not supposed to be a disciple of the Lord just to hang out with people that believe. I'm down here to get to know others, everybody. Hear them out. You know what I think is so important is showing God's light through ourselves. So when I run into someone on my team that doesn't believe, the last thing I'm going to do is be rude to them and say, I don't want to talk to you. I can't be friends with you. I want to be best friends with them. I want to show God's light in me. Show them how happy I am. Show them how hungry I am for every single day, how grateful I am. I want them to say, wow, whatever that guy's doing, I want some of it. I want some of the Holy Spirit. And I think that is so important for two reasons. One, just because someone believes something different than you doesn't mean that you can't be around them. Yeah, because the people that need your help, uh, Jesus talks about it in the Bible. He talks about when he came down, the Pharisees were expecting Jesus to hang out with him. But he was hanging out with the tax collectors. They were furious because they were the ones that were doing everything by the book and right, and they believed, and the tax collectors weren't. And Jesus said, am I, am I not a doctor? Did I come to heal the sick or not? He wasn't supposed to be down there hanging out with the Pharisees. He was hanging out with the sick, the tax collectors. He was helping them. And that's what I think we are doing. That's one of the reasons why I think it's so important, because we are here to heal the sick. That's what our job is. We're down here to spread God's love and show God's love. So when we meet people like that, I think it's so important that we show God's love through ourselves. And the verse that goes with that is Psalms 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God shows us. God shows us what he wants us to do. I had no idea I'd be speaking here. I didn't know. I'd never been to Passionate Life Church. I got acquainted with Dan and Pastor Andrew. God showed, he, he showed a light to me. He lit a light to my, his word and a light to my path. It was right there. It was right in front of me. The opportunity to be here today. I think that verse is so special because sometimes in our life, we have no idea what's going on. We have no idea what's next for us. We have the unknown. What's next in my life? What's next in my journey with Jesus? Four weeks ago, I had no idea what was next. But you know what? This opportunity presented itself. I said, what a great opportunity. He is literally showing me. He is lighting the path. Dalton, this is where I want you to go. I want you to hop on I-70, 
Take a left on E470 and go right here. And there's a little place called Passionate Life Church. And look, I'm here today. So pushing yourself and others. If you wouldn't mind, could you put on Matthew 7, verses 3 through 5? I think it was two slides before. And pushing yourself and others is the third element I want to talk about in rebuilding in your faith, rebuilding in your life, rebuilding on a football team. Within the Broncos, it's so important for me to always push myself. We have four months off. We get four months off. Next year it's going to be three because we're going to be busy in the month of January. But we get four months off. You don't have to do a thing. College, you're regimented. Every single day, you have two days off. They tell you your schedule throughout the whole day. NFL, you're free to do what you want. It is so important in the offseason to push yourself. Because if you don't, you're going to come back and show back up in April and you're not going to have a job anymore. You have to push yourself every single day. If I show back up and I have too much body fat, fine, maybe cut. If I show up and I'm two pounds, three pounds underweight or overweight, fine, maybe cut. That's how extreme it is. My first year as a Denver Bronco, I wrote a pretty big check to the Denver Broncos because I couldn't weigh a certain amount. It's crazy. It's how serious they take it. You have to, for every pound you're off of your weight, $700. It's crazy. That's how serious they take it. So you've got to be able to push yourself every single day. Listen, I drive by McDonald's four times a day. You know how bad I want to stop there? Oh, now we got an in and out And then I heard there's a Whataburger going up in the Springs. It's getting ugly, y'all. It's not good. And my fiancé likes to eat Cheetos and Gushers for dinner, so it's like I'm struggling on a lot of different areas. So pushing yourself and others, I see that every day throughout my career, how important that is. And not only myself, but other people. I get to work with guys like Von Miller. Von Miller is a great football player. That dude I was playing on Madden growing up. I have to try to hold him accountable because I'm trying to be a leader for the Broncos. I'm trying to be a leader on this offense. You know how intimidating it is to tell Von Miller what he's doing wrong? It's not fun. It's not fun. But that's part about being a great leader is holding people accountable. And the most important part about accountability is the person you're telling it to. I speak from the heart on this. I don't like to be told no. I don't like to be told what I do wrong. I'm getting better at that, especially with something I take so serious like football. But the person that's getting told what they can do better, it's on them. That's the big part about accountability. It's easy to be the person telling people what they're doing wrong. It's the hard job to be the one that's told you're doing something wrong and to do something about it, and decide to do it better, and say, hey, you know what, I appreciate that. So I see that with football and on my team every single day. But it's the same way with faith. It's the same way with our walk with God. Can we hold others accountable in the right way, encourage them, push them to be closer with God, make better decisions? Of course we can. But it's the person that's getting told it that has to do the big job. So Matthew 7, verses 3 through 5, and says, And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye? When you have a log in your own, how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend. I see that in football every day because you know what? If I want to hold anyone accountable on my football team, I better make sure I'm on my P's and Q's before I do. I got to make sure I'm doing everything right on and off the field before I try to get anyone else to do it. Because if I do, they're going to mention the thing I did wrong right away. So if I want to tell my team to hustle in and out of the huddle, I better make sure there's not one play all year that I don't hustle unless they're going to find that. And I think it's the same thing with faith, is it's very quick for us to look at other people and think what they could do better in their life and judge them and say, man, they could do this better as a Christian. But the truth is, the best best knowledge you're ever going to get is by looking yourself in the mirror and figuring out what you can do better yourself. Because it goes back to identity. Thank you. And it goes back to identity and knowing who you are. And that's one of the biggest traits that I've found out through my football career and through my walk with God that has helped me is looking myself in the mirror first. And usually I never have time to get to my teammates because there's so much that I want to correct. Whether it's football, whether it's my walk with God. There was a verse with pushing yourself, Proverbs 16.9. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Love this verse. It's right here. Anyone that wants to see it, I'll show you. I got like Bible verses everywhere. All over. Like I can even unbutton it. Like these are, it's just, it goes on and on. It goes on and on. My girl, my fiance told me I have to stop. But the, the heart of man plans his way. We can plan our way as much as we would like. We can think 
I can think I know what I'm eating for lunch. I can think I know what I'm going to bed tonight or what God has in store for me my third year or, I have, or what I was thinking was going to be planned today. But truth is, the Lord already has it established. We can push ourselves and push ourselves as much as we want, but the Lord has steps laid out already. So the reason I mention that verse <clears throat> is because we just have to have faith and trust in the Lord through the good and through the bad. There's going to be great things that happen in life. There's going to be trials and tribulations. But where do you stand when times get tough? Do you believe in God? Do you trust in Him that He already has a plan for you? Or do you turn cold shoulder on? I love that verse so much. Learn from your failures is the fourth key point that I think is so important. Getting to know others, pushing yourself in others, and having an identity. And then learning from your failures. Throughout my football career, I have failed a lot. I have failed a lot. I tell you about a couple stories. Nebraska football camp. Wyoming football camp, my first two weeks at Kansas State, I have failed many a times. And listen, you guys are Broncos fans, and I hear about it from y'all. It's okay. Just want to let you guys know that we're human, okay, for next year. We are human, and we do fail. Throughout the season, when we fail, I can promise you one thing. One thing you don't want to do in the National Football League is ever fail backwards and fail and not fail forward. I'm talking about failing forward and saying, man, I'm not going to let that get to me. Because when you're out there on the field, and like I said, there's a 380-pound guy drooling, if you fail backwards and you say, man, and, and you're thinking about it and you're worried about it and you're in bad spirits, he's going to do it to you all game long. It's going to get bad. I know that because whenever I see a guy that I can tell he knows he failed and he's sad about it and he's, he has no, no more confidence, that's when I go my hardest. Because I can tell. It's time to attack. This guy's not ready. So the most important thing I have to do in football is always fail forward. If I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail going forward. Because I know I'm going to fail. It's going to happen. But guess what? I'm going to get back up really, really quick. I'm going to tell Drew I slipped because it was raining, even if it's hot outside and not no rain. I'm going to say, I'm ready to go the next play. You know what I mean? He might mention to me it's not raining, but I don't care. I'm going to tell him, I'm good, bro. I'm going to slip your grass. I'm not going to let anyone know that you beat me. I'm not going to let anyone know that I just failed. I'm going to fail forward, get back up, and keep moving. Short-term memory and keep rolling. That's what has made me good at football. But, you know, you look at your walk with God, too. Look at my walk with God and all the experiences I've had, all the times I felt like I fell short of the glory of God and that I let Jesus down. I've learned so much to correlate what I've learned in this game of football. I correlate it right with my walk with God. Or what I learned with my walk with God, I correlate it with football. And failing forward in our faith is so important. God knows we're sinners. He knows we're going to fall short. He wants, to see, he wants to see us say, please forgive us and let's get back up pull up our bootstraps and go back to work and be great Christians. Say, hey man, how can I spread the word today? I know I fell short yesterday, but how can I spread the word better today? How can I be a better man today? How can I glorify God today? I think that's very important. And Luke 137 is one of my, another verse I want to mention here, and that's for nothing will be impossible with God. I think that is so true. I, I stand up here so proud today because you know what? If football is taken tomorrow, I could care less if I play another down of football. I love that sport so much. But I know who I am. I have found out who Dalton Reisner is. And that's the man that wants to spread Jesus' word and make an impact and leave a legacy. In 10 years, if you guys don't mention a thing about how good of a football player I was, that's fine with me. What would make me 10 times more proud is if anyone mentioned that I was a good person. That they saw, they saw God's light shine through me. That's the legacy that I'm trying to leave. That's the person I'm trying to be. You know, I come from a family that didn't make very much money. We got Christmas presents dropped off on our doorstep. Come from a very humble beginning. of so mom and dad that worked extremely hard to get to where they're at. So now that I have this platform and I'm an NFL player, I don't care about the fame and fortune. I don't care if that stuff lasts. I want to be a good man at Jesus because that's what's going to last me forever. Forever. And I mentioned Luke 137 just because coming from where I come from and being able to be in the NFL and live my dream while being a disciple for Jesus and being able to do it in front of millions of people, I can't quit smiling. And that, that tells me that there is nothing that's impossible with God, 100%. Another point I wanted to mention is that belief is different than faith. Belief is different than faith. You can have belief and you can have faith. The big difference between guys who believe they can make it 
and guys who have faith they can make it. There's a big difference. I want to talk about faith a little bit, what I think goes into faith. The first thing that goes into faith, I'd say, be purpose. And I mentioned it earlier about purpose. What is your purpose? I have a story from the NFL Combine. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the NFL Combine, but it's pretty much a big way to interview for jobs. So I'm at the NFL Combine. I think about, thought about this my whole life, how exciting it would be to be there. And you have meetings, they're 30 minutes long with GMs and head coaches and you know, they run about 30 minutes, and I had about four already that night. I won't name the team. I think I named the team the first service. I probably shouldn't have done that. But it was with the team, and it was supposed to be a 30-minute long interview. My agents had told me beginning of this process, because you have to sign an NFL agent, hey, Dalton, you know, you need to be aware of that you're very outspoken about your faith. That, not, not, that might not be something that teams want to hear. So I told my agents what they wanted to hear. I'm like, okay, okay, I got it. I'll tone it down. And got to NFL Combine. And I walk into this room, and one of the first questions I was asked by this head coach was, what would your three priorities be if you showed up to Nashville? No, I just did it again. (laughs) Okay, it's our secret. I was sitting there with the Titans, yep. (laughs) He, uh, He asked me my three priorities, and, you know, I... I thought I might get a question like this, and I thought long and hard about Jesus Christ sitting right next to me, and it was really hard because we all know what the coach wants to hear. We all want to know. He he wants to hear football. He's paying you a lot of money to make football your priority. I just kept thinking, if Jesus Christ was sitting right next to me, man, like, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I could not say it was football and have him right there. With all he's given me, all he's gifted for me, all he's blessed me with, I'm going to sit here and tell him a silly game of football is my priority? Like, come on. So the coach asked me, and uh, I told him my faith. And two minutes later, he closed the notebook, and the meeting was over. But you know what's cool? Is it was supposed to be 30 minutes. It only lasted two. But I felt like on the way out, I was dapping up Jesus the whole way, man. I felt like, <laughs> felt like it was great. And you know, that was really hard. Because football had been something I'd given my whole life's work to. And at that moment... I felt like if I didn't say football, that I might lose a great opportunity to go play in the NFL. But it was so cool because that was a true test of my faith, a true test of the purpose that I believed in. And it just felt so good to walk out of that room feeling like, man, I really just went to battle for Jesus. And you know what? I don't care if I would have went first round to one of those guys. I went second round to the Broncos, and I'm here today. That couldn't be, life couldn't have worked out better. I'm so fortunate. So fortunate. A few other things that go in with faith that I think are extremely important, because you can believe. When I grew up, people tell me all the time, I just had this type of faith to me. Even though I was a 1A kid that worked on a ranch, no one ever went to go play Division I or NFL from Wiggins, I just had faith that I could. My dad would mention something about NASCAR, I'd say, that looks really easy, don't you just have to press on the wheel and go like this? I just was always, I always had a lot of belief in myself. Faith is different, and that's what I grew into having was faith. Purpose is first, what I just mentioned, and then having a mission. You can have a purpose in life. Each and every one of us in this room can wake up and feel like we have a purpose, a purpose for Jesus, a purpose to love other people, but do we have a mission? I have missions every single day. So many missions I want to accomplish, and my purpose and my identity helps me accomplish those missions. Whether it's you want to read the Bible more, whether it's you want to pray more, whether it's you want to spread the word to two or three people that don't necessarily know about Jesus, whatever it may be, whether it's me talking to that one guy on the team that never bows his head when we pray, is it me going and talking to him? Is that a mission of mine? It's important to have those missions in your life for Jesus and know that we want to accomplish them. That helps you have faith. That helps you believe that you're living for a reason and have faith that there's something higher than you. Legacy. I mentioned that a little bit. You want to leave a legacy. You don't want to leave a legacy of materialistic, earthly things. You want to leave a legacy about the type of person you were, how you treated other people. Man, I saw that guy. I saw God through that person every single day. That's the legacy I want to leave. Football is great, but so much more important to me, it's about people. I love people. I love meeting people. I love everyone in this room. That's what we're down here to do is to love each other. Spread the word and enjoy the world that God made for us. So what type of legacy are we going to leave? No one cares about our jobs. No one's going to talk about that in 10, 15 years. Maybe Peyton Manning, but I'm not there. So, you know, 
and a destiny. Legacy is what you leave behind. Destiny is the future. What is your destiny? What is your family's destiny? What type of destiny do you want? And with us, we all know our destiny. That's the great part. But how many people can we go out there and tell about the destiny we want them for them as well? We all want to live eternally with Jesus Christ. And that's what's so cool. That's what's waiting for us on the other end, is eternal life with Jesus. I could never quite fathom that. It actually makes my head hurt because I'm so time-oriented. I have a schedule on my phone and my notes, and every minute of the day it seems like I have something going on. But when I think about living eternally with Jesus, oh my gosh, like I'm probably going to be the best cowboy in the world. I cannot wait. It's going to be awesome. Those are the four things that I feel like play into having faith, having a destiny having a legacy, having a mission, and having a purpose all correlate into helping us have faith. When I think about football and me having faith in the game of football and faith in myself, I have a purpose with who, what, I, what I play left guard. I have missions, what I want to do to guys that's not so nice on the field. Legacy, what I want to leave behind after football, and a destiny of what I know my future is. And the same thing goes with my faith. John 6.47 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes will have eternal life. The reason I put this verse on here is because I have a really cool story. Um, I have tattoos all over my arms. It's all Bible verses. And I was on an airplane, and I had John 647. Truly, truly, I say to you. And this guy kept looking at my arm. I think I was coming back from Kansas State to Colorado. This guy kept looking at my arm, and I didn't know if, I didn't know what was going on. So he kept looking at my arm, and pretty soon he asked, what is that? And I was a little bit baffled because I thought that most people knew what a Bible verse was, but he didn't have any idea. So I told him what John 6.47 was as a Bible verse, and I read the verse to him. It led to a one-hour conversation, the whole plane, plane ride, about how cool that was. I talked to him about eternal life. I talked to him about what it meant to, to truly believe. And that conversation really inspired me to know more about Jesus because that was the first time that I'd really talked openly to a complete stranger about Jesus Christ. And I was a little bit caught off guard, so I didn't really know too much of what to say, other than I love Jesus. I think I said that a lot. But you know, what's cool is we had that whole conversation by a tattoo on my arm. I got to spread Jesus's, Jesus's word to another person. He told me that he was so excited about it. He was going to go home and look more into it. And it was an awesome conversation. It leads me in to my next quote that I want to mention, which is, Seek the Lord in good times. Seek the Lord in bad times. For he will always be watching over you. The reason I mention that is because I think that whenever things go good in our life, and when things go bad in our life, we tend to pray more and less. At least I do. I'll speak for myself. When things go bad, I tend to be praying to Jesus a lot because I like to lean on him and ask him, please help me. Please help me with this. Help this relative. Whatever it may be, ask for prayer. But when things go good, I catch myself just living the life and not praying as much and just expecting that's how it should be. Thank you, God, for taking care of me when things were bad, but now I'm good. I think that I need to make sure every single day I'm praying to him whether things are good, whether things are bad. And sometimes don't pray to Jesus and always ask for something. Pray to Jesus and just say, thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to be down here. Thank you for allowing me to be at Passionate Life Church. Thank you for allowing me to have this platform to spread your love. I hope I'm making you proud. I hope I'm glorifying you. I think it's so important for us to do that from time to time as opposed to always praying and asking for something from Jesus. I'm going to end with this verse. Ephesians 6.11 Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the schemes of the devil. When I think about football, we definitely don't go to war. Because there's guys out there fighting for our country that go to war. But we go to battle, especially in the trenches as an offensive lineman. We go to battle. We got to go out there, and our job is to literally protect other guys on the field. Literally like protecting a flag. No one touch Drew Locke. No one touch Melvin Gordon. No one touch them. Our job is to protect them. Make holes, open up ways for guys to go. We literally go into battle. We have to put on our armor. I take my pinkies together, my fingers together. I have hard casts on my thumbs because a lot of them are broken during this season. I armor up. I put on shoulder pads, a helmet, mouthpiece, knees, braces, cleats, ankle braces, you name it. We strap up and go put our bodies on the line for the game of football. But what's even 100% cooler than that is what we do in our life with God is we put on our armor, we strap up, and we go to battle for Jesus. When I was in at the NFL Combine, I went to battle for Jesus Christ. I won that one. I promise you that. That's what I encourage you all to do, is go to battle for Jesus. Things are going to get tough. Like I mentioned earlier, it's going to be hard to push through at times. 
But go to battle for Jesus. Spread his word. Be good to other people. Let his light shine through you. That's what God wants us to do is put on the armor and go to battle for him every single day. We'll always have his back. Thank you so much, Passionate Life Church. I love you guys. Want to pray? Yeah, sure. I'm going to pray for you guys real quick and close out. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. Yeah. I'm so honored and so thankful and so humbled that I got the opportunity to speak about you, yeah. speak about my journey and talk to Passionate Life Church, which is by no doubt my fiance and I's new home to come to church, 100%. We love you so much. We're so thankful for you. We ask that you tell us how to have more courage for you every single day, how to be better disciples for you, Lord, how we can make a bigger impact down here with what we were given by you. Thank you so much, God, for everything you do in our lives each and every day. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Awesome. Come on, who's ready to go to battle? For Jesus, come on. So good. Thank you so much, Dalton. Amazing, amazing word. We're now going to transition into our response time. And as your pastor, you know that this is the most important time of the service, is that we would respond. God's been speaking to us over the last several minutes through Dalton, and and he's just been stirring up a lot of things. And so uh, maybe you can relate with Dalton and, and his story where maybe you just, you believed in God. But if you're really honest with yourself, you never had faith in him. You never truly gave your whole life to Christ and really followed him. So I want to give you an opportunity to do that. Now, if everyone could just bow their heads and and close their eyes. This is your moment. And, And several things that Dalton said today is, you know what? This afternoon isn't guaranteed. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. This, but this moment is. And this moment can change the rest of your life forever. I wanna ask you a question today. Are you ready to follow Jesus with your whole heart? Are you ready to stop living back and forth? Are you ready to go all in? Every head bowed, every eye If that's you, just slip up a hand. This is your personal declaration of faith. Come on, just slip it up and then slip it on. Yes, yes, come on. Yes, thank you, Jesus. You just slip it up, then slip it down. I just want to pray with you today. Thank you, God. I just want to ask that everyone would repeat this prayer this morning as we help those making the greatest decision of their life today. Dear Jesus, I thank you for what you did on the cross. And I ask this morning that you would forgive me of all my sins, that you would come into my life and be my Lord and King, And from this day forward, I will follow you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, let's give them a hand clap today. Heaven is rejoicing. Thank you so much for staying connected to Passionate Life Church. If you'd like more information, you can email us at passionatelifechurch at gmail.com. Be sure to like, subscribe, or share this with a friend. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon.